Twelve Angry Men was originally a teleplay written by Reginald Rose and was broadcast on CBS in 1954 as part of the Studio One series. It was later rewritten for film in 1957 and was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Screenplay. Today it stands as the number five most highly rated film of all time on IMDb. Here are seven screenwriting secrets in Twelve Angry Men. Twelve Angry Men is a unique courtroom drama in that we never actually see the courtroom drama itself. The story starts at the end of the trial as the jurors retire to the jury room. So it's important that they set up the rules of the game so we understand exactly what's at stake. If there's a reasonable doubt in your minds as to the guilt of the accused, then you must bring me a verdict of not guilty. One man is dead. Another man's life is at stake. However you decide, your verdict must be unanimous. Once the jurors are in the jury room, we're further reminded of the rules. But you know that we uh, have a first-degree murder charge here, and if we vote the accused guilty, uh, we've got to send him to the chair. Just remember that this has to be 12 to nothing either way. Um, that's the law. And there's one added detail that sets the stage for delicious conflict. I called the weather bureau this morning. This is going to be the hottest day of the year. <laughs> Make sure you establish the rules of the game early in the story so the audience can then enjoy the story itself. The entire story of 12 Angry Men takes place in a single room. We essentially have one gigantic scene. But there are clear plot points in the story, broken down into sequences. Each sequence begins with a new direction in the action, a new objective. Let's take a look. The first sequence is the end of the court session. It's the only time we see the defendant. Here's the new objective that pushes us into the next sequence. It's now your duty to sit down and try and separate the facts from the fancy. The jury will now retire. In the next sequence, the jurors settle in and figure out their plan by taking a preliminary vote. When juror number eight is the only one to vote not guilty, it pushes us into a new objective and a new sequence. Oh, what are we doing now? I guess we talk. Sequence 3 occurs as the other 11 jurors try to show juror number 8 that he's wrong. But then we get a new objective that pushes us into the following sequence. Tonight this fine upright boy admitted buying the night of the killing. Let's talk about it. Alright, let's talk about it. Let's get it in here and look at it. I'd like to see it again, Mr. Foreman. So in sequence 4, the jurors discuss the knife. This ends in a proposition by juror number 8. I want you 11 men to vote by secret written ballot. There are 11 votes for guilty. I won't stand alone. We'll take in a guilty verdict to the judge right now. But if anyone votes not guilty, we stay here and talk it out. Sure enough, juror number nine changes his vote and pushes us into a new sequence of arguing. This ends when the foreman pushes us into the following sequence. Shall we continue? Well, I, I think we ought to take a break. You know, one man's inside and I think we ought to wait for him. Both the characters and the audience are given a respite. But it's an important sequence as we learn more insights into the jurors' backgrounds. Sequence 7 starts when the break ends, and their objective is now to discuss the elevated train and the old man. This causes juror number 5 to change his vote to not guilty. A new objective arises when juror number 11 wants to discuss the defendant's actions of the night of the killing. There is a question I would like to ask. Let us assume that the boy really did commit the murder. Now, if he really had killed his father, why would he come back home three hours later? Wouldn't he be afraid of being caught? So sequence 8 involves him questioning the boy's actions, ending with his vote changing to not guilty. The new objective then emerges as they discuss the old man running to the door. And pop-ups are full of a basis, where are we looking? Hold on a second, hold on. Did the old man say he ran to the door? Look, I don't remember what he said, but I don't see how he could have run to the door. He said he went from his bedroom to the front door. Now, isn't that enough? Mr. Foreman, I'd like to see a diagram of the apartment. The sequence ends with another vote being called, this time by a surprise juror. In the tenth sequence, we get another break as the storm settles in. Notice how it's also the first time the vote is evenly split. The next sequence starts when juror number eight brings up the boy's memory of the movies. Juror number 4 has a hard time remembering movies that he recently saw. Sequence 12 then starts shortly after that, as juror number 2 wants to discuss this. Uh, 
There's something I'd like to say. I mean, it's been bothering me a little, and as long as we're stuck... Now, the boy was five feet seven inches tall. His father was six two. It's a very awkward thing to stab down into the chest of someone who's more than half a foot taller than you are. Juror number five demonstrates the real way someone would use a switchblade knife. Juror number seven changes his vote just to be able to get out of there more quickly. The sequence ends as juror number eight calls for another vote. In sequence 13, there's a significant shift in the balance of power, now sitting at 9 to 3 in favor of not guilty. So we get juror number 10's racist tirade. The penultimate sequence begins as juror number 8 issues this statement. We nine can't understand how you three are still so sure. Maybe you can tell us. I'll try. Juror number 4 starts this new sequence with a powerful argument one for which juror number eight has no answer. She got a good look at the boy in the act of stabbing his father. This is unshakable testimony. What do you think? This is excellent screenwriting. The more juror number eight accomplishes, the stronger the antagonistic forces get. The reversal comes as they discuss the woman and her eyeglasses, pushing us into the final sequence. I have a reasonable doubt now. 11 to 1. What do you want? I say he's guilty. You want to hear your arguments. And notice how the finale is with juror number three, the most powerful antagonist of the story, saving the best for last. Sure, you can take all the time hobbling around the room, but you can't prove it! I bet you $5,000 I'd remember the movies I saw. I'm telling you everything that's gone on has been twisted. This business with the glasses? How do you know she didn't have them on? This woman testified in open court! So the lesson here, we all naturally break our stories down into acts and scenes, but don't overlook sequences. They are vital elements of your screenplay. There are several moments of brilliant dialogue in 12 Angry Men. It's an art form that takes dialogue to a higher level. You see this a lot in Billy Wilder's dialogue as well. Characters say biting, witty comebacks that leave the other person speechless. You're not going to tell me that we're supposed to believe this kid knowing what he is? Listen, I've lived among them all my life. Listen, what about the woman across the street? If her testimony don't prove it, nothing does. You don't believe the boy's story. How come you believe the woman's? She's one of them, too, isn't she? Supposing you were the one that was on trial. Supposing you talk us all out of this and the uh, kid really did knife his father, huh? He's a common, ignorant slob. He don't even speak good English. He doesn't even speak good English. Again, I beg pardon. I beg pardon. What are you so polite about? For the same reason you're not. It's the way I was brought up. Everything of anyone in his right mind would grow a stack. Huh? You're just trying to bait me. He did an excellent job. Or oh, the boy is guilty, period. Know what I mean, my friend? He's got those cough drops. We're all gone, my friend. This is an excellent example of why it's important for screenwriters to watch films and read screenplays. You can't teach this kind of thing in a class. We must constantly expose ourselves to great work, and it'll slowly become a part of our own toolbox. In the film for 12 Angry Men, they make it a point to not reveal any of the jurors' names. So I checked Reginald Rose's screenplay, and sure enough, the characters are simply named by juror number. There's also a note from the screenwriter himself. The notes on characters are extremely brief, since it is felt that what they are and who they are will be revealed in their dialogue and actions during the course of the film. So a question suddenly occurred to me. How would you write 12 Angry Men as a spec script? For those that aren't familiar with the term, a speculation script is an unsolicited screenplay that's written with the hopes of getting it sold or optioned. That means that it's all about conveying the story through the written word. In the film, they cleverly have everybody sit in order by juror number, but in a screenplay, we don't have the benefit of seeing the actors. We can quickly distinguish the foreman because of his title, and also juror number 8 because he's the only one that votes for not guilty in the beginning. But how can we make sure the reader is able to keep the other characters straight? First, give us some information about their life outside of the jury room. The screenplay cleverly gives us exposition on the characters' occupations. This gives us a little more insight on their background. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm the uh, assistant head coach at the uh, Andrew J. McCorkle High School. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not Queens. Mm -hmm. 
I remember I was arguing with the guy I worked next to at the bank a couple weeks ago. He called me an idiot, so I yelled at him. I run a messenger service, the Beck and Call Company. The name is my wife's idea. I was only wondering how the market closed. You got a seat on the exchange? I'm a broker. I just finished painting an apartment that overlooked an L line. I was there for three days. What was it like? What do you mean? Noisy. Oh, brother. Hit them where they live. That's my motto. I made 27 grand last year selling marmalade. Hey, you a salesman? I'm an architect. You guys can talk the ears right off my head. You know what I mean? I got three garages of mine going to pot while you're talking. So let's get done and get out of here. What do you do? I'm a watchmaker. Oh, really? Well, I imagine the finest watchmakers in the world come from Europe, huh? It's a product I work on at the agency. The uh, breakfast with a built-in bounce. I wrote that line. Second, make each character sound unique in their dialogue. Characters should sound like themselves and not like each other. You should be able to cover up their name and know who's speaking that line of dialogue. So let's try it out. Which juror says this? Even without the brilliant acting performance by Lee J. Cobb, we see the character of juror number three revealed through unique dialogue. Here's another great example. Juror number seven wants to get out of there because he has tickets to the baseball game in the evening. So look at how much of his dialogue is sports related. This kid is five for all. You stay in there and pitch, you know? You know he's blowing the stacks over some guy in fan. Yeah, oh, and the Baltimore Rooter is from from again now. And pop-ups are falling for base hits wherever oh, we look. Hold on a second, hold on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and we go into extra innings here, huh? <laughs> Here's another pop quiz. Which juror says this all the time? This allows us to visualize juror number 10 every time we see him on the written page. And finally, as Reginald Rose declared, reveal character through words and actions. Despite the fact that we don't know any of the jurors' names, they're still human beings that have their own pains and weaknesses. We begin to understand their psyches and the reasons for their behavior. For example, doesn't it become clear which juror this is? Which juror is this? Look at these lines of dialogue. Don't we know who the bigot is by now? And which juror is the most polite, shielding his sensitivity of being an immigrant? And which juror says this powerful monologue? In addition to the fact that he's older than the other jurors, this gives us a tremendous insight into juror number nine. After the first vote, juror number eight stands alone against the other 11. He says this quite often. We can't decide it in five minutes, supposing we're wrong. Supposing we're wrong. Supposing they're wrong. Well, people make mistakes, could they be wrong? But we're just gambling on probabilities, we may be wrong. So what's his biggest fear? Well, I don't know you, but I'm betting you've never been wronger in your life. Supposing you talk us all out of this and the uh, kid really did knife his father, huh? Twelve Angry Men is an important lesson because it's an extreme example of the importance of revealing character through words and actions. I'm not sure what the correct terminology is for this in screenwriting, but there's a brilliant phenomenon that occurs in Twelve Angry Men. In moments of conflict, characters defeat their own arguments. A lot of this occurs as the jurors argue against juror number eight, but end up inadvertently supporting his argument. We can't decide it in five minutes, supposing we're wrong. Supposing we're wrong. Yeah. Supposing this whole building should fall down on my head, you can suppose anything. That's right. Could they be wrong? Oh, come on, nobody can know a thing like that. This isn't an exact science. That's right, it isn't. This happens with juror number three several times. When they discuss the unique characteristics of the switchblade knife, notice how juror number three's anger doesn't help his cause. It's a very unusual knife. I've never seen one like it. 
Neither had the storekeeper who sold it to the boy. No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. It's just possible. And I say it's not possible. Maybe there are ten knives like that, so what? Maybe there are. Notice how he again defeats his own argument when they discuss the old man running to the door. He said 15. He said 20 seconds. What are you trying to destroy? He said 15. He was an old man half the time he was confused. How could he be positive about anything? And when they discuss what the old man heard from the boy, he falls right into the trap. The old man who lived downstairs says he heard the kid yell out, I'm going to kill you. This phrase, how many times have all of us used it? Probably thousands. I could kill you for that, darling. Don't tell me you didn't mean it. Anybody says a thing like that the way he said it, they mean it. You're a sadist. Kill him, Molly. Kill him. You don't really mean you'll kill me, do you? And finally, he gets desperate as he runs out of arguments. It's not so easy to arrange all the evidence in order. You can throw out all the other evidence. The woman saw him do it. What else do you want? You're alone. But what about all the other evidence? What about... All that stuff, the, the, the knife, the, the whole business. Well, you said we could throw out all the other evidence. 12 Angry Men is brilliant in that characters get trapped in their own mistakes. Perhaps something to think about in our own writing. <laughs> 12 Angry Men breaks quite a few screenwriting rules. I'm sure you've heard all of these by now. Don't have talking heads sitting around a table. Well, what if we had them sitting around the table and talking for the entire film? Show, don't tell. How about a screenplay with almost 100% dialogue? Never introduce too many characters at once. How about 12 characters all at the same time? Make sure character names don't sound the same. What if we had character names that are almost identical? This is a blatant disregard for these so-called rules. So why does 12 Angry Men work so well? Why are we so mesmerized by dialogue from 12 people we don't know? The bottom line is that it's a top-notch story, and it nails the one thing that eludes many of us, conflict. The best organic conflict comes from characters having objectives that are in complete opposition to each other. In 12 Angry Men, that can't be any more true. The characters' objectives are black and white, a verdict of guilty or not guilty. So there's guaranteed conflict throughout every moment in the film, I honestly think the guy's guilty. Couldn't change my mind if you talked for a hundred years. What do you think you're going to accomplish? You're not going to change anybody's mind. So if you want to be stubborn and hang this jury, go ahead. You have sat here and voted guilty with everyone else because there are some baseball tickets burning a hole in your pocket. Yeah, excitable! Just... You bet I'm excitable! We're trying to put a guilty man in the chair where he belongs! Twelve Angry Men proves to us that you don't need fancy cameras or elaborate set pieces to create a compelling story. What you do need is an outstanding screenplay with clear and powerful conflict. There are seven brilliant moments that directly engage the audience, compelling us to want to know the answer. In 12 Angry Men, it feels like we're sitting at the table with the jurors. So when they ask questions to figure out the truth, they might as well be asking us directly. First, we have the knife. What automatically happens when you hear this? The knife this fine, upright boy admitted buying the night of the killing. Let's talk about it. All right, let's talk about it. Let's get it in here and look at it. I'd like to see it again, Mr. Foreman. Don't you want to see the knife as well? And when juror number four says this... Now suppose we take these facts one at a time. Don't our brains go into overdrive as we start putting the pieces together for ourselves? One, the boy admitted going out of the house at 8 o'clock on the night of the murder after being slapped several times by his father. Two, he went directly to a neighborhood junk shop where he bought one of those... Uh, switch knives. Switchblade knives. Three. He met some friends of his in front of a tavern about 8.45. Four. They identified the death weapon in court as that very same knife. Five. He arrived home at about 10 o'clock. Now, what happened to the switch knife? He claims that it fell through a hole in his pocket on the way to the movie sometime between 11.30 and uh, 3.10. Later, as the jury starts discussing the elevated train, Juror number eight asks this. Has anybody any idea how long it takes an elevator train going at medium speed to pass a given point? Don't you naturally start thinking of the answer yourself? So we're completely engrossed when he says this. Let's take two pieces of testimony and try to put them together. And how about when juror number 11 starts with this? There is a question I would like to ask. 
Let us assume that the boy really did commit the murder. If he really had killed his father, why would he come back home three hours later? Wouldn't he be afraid of being caught? But if he knew the knife could be identified, why did he leave it there in the first place? Don't we naturally start thinking the same questions? This wonderful sequence involves visual action as well. Where are we looking? Did your man say he ran to the door? What I like to find out of an old man who drags one foot when he walks, because he had a stroke last year, can get from his bedroom to his front door in 15 seconds. Uh, Mr. Foreman, I'd like to see a diagram of the apartment. Now, the old man was in this bedroom right here. He says he crossed to the door and walked down the hall, opened the front door, just in time to see the boy running down the stairs. Am I right so far? What are you doing? I'm going to try it, see how long it took him. Juror number two brings up something that's been on his mind. Uh, there's something I'd like to say. I mean, it's been bothering me a little, and as long as we're stuck. Now, the boy was five feet, seven inches tall. His father was six, two. What's the matter? Did you ever see a knife pack? No. You? No. Anybody here ever see a knife pack? How do you use a switchblade? Well, he never used it like this. When they discuss the boy's memory of what movies he saw, look at how we're engaged through this entire exchange. Putting yourself in the boy's place, do you think you could remember tales? After an upsetting experience, such as being slapped in the face by your father, I'd like to ask you a personal question. Go ahead. Where were you last night? My wife and I went to the movie. What did you see? The Scarlet Circle. What was the second feature? The, um... Who was in The Amazing Mrs. Bainbridge? Barbara... Long, I think it was. Who else? And finally, in this powerful sequence, don't you naturally wonder why juror number nine is asking about this? I'm sure you'll pardon me for this, but I was wondering why you rub your nose like that. Oh, the woman who testified that she saw the killing had those same marks on the sides of her nose. No glasses, but women do that. See if you can get a mental picture of it. Do you wear glasses when you go to bed? No, I don't. No one wears eyeglasses to bed. And she herself testified the killing took place just as she looked out. The lights went off a split second later. She couldn't have had time to put them on there. When you engage the audience with questions that must be answered, you essentially have them hooked until those answers are provided. Do this enough, and they'll be along for the entire ride of your screenplay. So what other films would you like to see me cover for screenwriting? Let me know in the comments below. A sincere thank you to my wonderful patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Also, be sure to subscribe and tap the bell to be notified of upcoming videos. More great content is on the way. Thank you so much for watching.